Okay, uh, we're giving the all, all clear. Apparently everyone's here. So um, thanks very much for coming. Um, good afternoon. Um, welcome to our What Happens in Vegas Stays in Vegas HR Lunch Club. Uh, I'm dismissing an employee for behaviour outside of the workplace. Um, it's lovely for us to be able to present to you today from the same room as each other um, in our Chester office, rather than from entirely separate locations as we've very much gotten used to recently. So this is very nice to see Michael yeah. today. <laughs> um, my name's Tori McHale. I'm a solicitor in the employment team, um, usually based in our Shrewsbury office. Uh, I'm also an associate member of the CIPD with a level seven accredited um, postgraduate diploma in HR management. Um, and this is actually the first presentation I'm giving since receiving that qualification, which is very exciting. And this is my colleague, Michael Reston, who is also a solicitor in the employment team. Um, so today we thought we would think a little outside the box and uh, present to you on how conduct, which takes place outside of the workplace, can potentially lead to a dismissal in some employment cases. Um, there's a fairly wide range of categories as to how this conduct could actually be problematic to the workplace. However, generally, employee conduct outside the workplace may become a misconduct issue if it affects or is likely to affect the employment relationship or the employee's ability to perform their work. So this could occur perhaps when they're not performing work, uh, but are arguably still representing the company. So staff parties or where they're wearing work uniform out in public, perhaps on their way to or from work, um, during their own private time when the individual can still be identified as being an employee of the company, so perhaps on social media, and where an employee is unable to fulfil their role due to um, repercussions of their conduct outside of work. So perhaps someone who's required to drive a vehicle as part of their role, such as a taxi driver, losing their licence due to a driving offence perhaps, and then is unable to perform their role. We'll look some, at some examples of misconduct uh, when such matters have arisen in case law and some proactive measures that can be taken by employers prior to these sorts of issues happening, as well as what they might be able to do when, if they do happen, um, to put you in the best possible um, situation to potentially dismiss an employee due to the types of misconduct if it's the appropriate scenario. I'm hoping the slides, there we go. Um, so firstly, it's important with each of these scenarios that we'll go through that we have a very basic understanding of the potential risks. As with any dismissal, uh, there's a risk of unfair dismissal claims if a qualifying employee, so someone who has two complete years of service, um, is dismissed. Section 98 of the Employment Rights Act deals with this. Uh, and it provides that a, di a dismissal will be held to be fair if the employer can show that the reason or principal reason for the dismissal was one of the five potentially fair reasons, which are capability, conduct, redundancy, breach of a statutory duty or restriction, and some other substantial reason. We'll refer to a few of these throughout the presentation. Um, and the tribunal finds that in all the circumstances, including the employer's size and administrative resources, the, employee, the, the employer acted reasonably in treating that reason as a sufficient reason for dismissal. The test for reasonableness or fairness uh, is usually divided into two parts, one being whether the employer followed a fair process, so whether it is procedurally a fair decision, um, and other the other being where, whether the employer acted reasonably in making a fair decision, which falls within the band of reasonable responses of what a reasonable employer would decide to do in that situation. So in cases of miscon uh, misconduct, the test in the, uh, the case of British Home Stores and Virtual applies in relation to the second stage of that test. Um, and the tribunal must be satisfied that at the time of the dismissal, the employer had a genuine belief in the employee's guilt. At the time of the dismissal, that belief was reasonable for the employer to hold. And at the time the employer formed that, that belief on those grounds, it had carried out as much of an investigation as was reasonable in those circumstances. Um, so it's therefore essential that a fair disciplinary process is followed in relation to any dismissal, including misconduct dismissals. 
um, to limit the risk of any successful claim against the company. Please do remember though that every case is different. Each matter is a case by case basis. And at any point, if you're unsure as to whether a potential decision to dismiss might be fair, seek advice before making any decisions. Okay, so um, I'm sure you're all fairly familiar with uh, what Tori's just described in terms of uh, potential, potentially fair reasons um, and, and conduct process. Um, so the question really for this conversation is, or the initial question certainly is, when is outside conduct, uh, actual conduct under section uh, 98 of the Employment Rights Act? Um, and essentially, uh, Initially, there was a case uh, in 83, 1983, Thompson and a lower motor, um, where it was, uh, it was held that, that conduct uh, outside the workplace can extend to, uh, conduct extends to conduct outside the workplace as well as that at work. And the key issue is whether the conduct in question pertains to the employment relationship. Um, so it may be fair to, to look at uh, the conduct of an employee and, and potentially dismiss them um, for that conduct outside the workplace. Uh, and as we've got this quote from the Singh case, Singh and uh, London Country Bus Services, um, it's so long as in some respect or other it affects the employee or could be thought to affect the employee when he is doing his work. Now I'd add to that also, obviously, there are also factors where you've got to consider whether it affects the business. And we'll talk a bit about those as well. Um, just to give you another example, Eggleton and Kerry Foods, um, which is a, an employment appeal tribunal case. Um, the employer was dismissed fairly uh, for fighting off site with a colleague. Um, and unfortunately, this is something that, that you do see. Uh, and we'll talk about things like alcohol fueling these things as well in, in a little bit. Um, but certainly um, in this case, they were fighting uh, between them about a girlfriend. Um, whilst the fight took place in the car park across the road, uh, they weren't on uh, you know, work grounds, uh, they weren't in uniform. Um, the conduct clearly affected working arrangements since the other employee concerns no longer felt safe to attend work. And often uh, I think where you get things like violence or, or abuse, um, you'll find there's a grievance from, the, from the, the, one of the affected employees and that, that may be the first thing that alerts you to that situation. Um, the fact that, that the dispute involved a purely dis domestic matter was found to be irrelevant, um, but the EAT uh, agreed with the first instance tribunal that the employee's conduct had completely broken the employer's trust, and obviously that's going to be an important test. There's also then um, the question of what if someone fails to prevent another colleague's misconduct outside work? Um, well, the employment tribunal found that it can in fact be within the range of reasonable responses open to the employer, where one employee failed to prevent another. Um, in, in the case of um, it's Thornalley and Linkage Community Trust, which is a, an employment tribunal case, uh, one of the employees trashed a hotel room essentially uh, on, a, on a work function. And uh, the, the colleague who was with them was also dismissed. And that was found to be fair in the range of reasonable responses. I suppose what I'd stress about that is, as, as we mentioned, is um, you'd want to make sure that you're checking the facts of each case um, themselves. Similarly, Keeble, uh, along, uh, Keeble and London Borough of Hammersmith and Fulham, this was a council employee who was a long-standing council employee. He was unfairly dismissed. Um, his conduct was he attended a political rally. There was a demonstration outside Parliament concerning anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, which obviously is still a hot topic. Uh, Mr. Keeble was a, a member of the Labour Party Marxists. He attended a counter demonstration, was filmed having an exchange with a demonstrator uh, on the other side, and he expressed somewhat controversial views, including the view that the Zionist movement uh, collaborated with the Nazis. Now, all of that was put on footage of the BBC and widely shared, and so he was identified as a council worker and dismissed. But the EAT, um, sorry, the ET, I should say, the Employment Tribunal, found um, that um, whilst his, um, his, uh, his actions were found to be conduct, they were linked to the workplace where he was identified on social media. But although there was also a, a, a bit of a procedural failing, the tribunal found that the 
the authority had acted outside the range of reasonable responses in this case. So that's a contrasting one where there's an unfair dismissal. Um, he had expressed his political views in a lawful way outside the workplace with no discernible link to his employer, albeit it could later be linked because of the, the TV footage, which is something we'll discuss with social media. Um, and uh, the Employment Tribunal did comment on that case that employees are generally entitled to promote their religious or political beliefs, providing they do so lawfully. And of course, that is a protected characteristic as well. I won't go in too much into social media. We're going to discuss that in a minute. Um, we have talked about it uh, in, a, in a previous HR lunch club with similar issues as well. Um, and essentially, you know, the, the, the issue, the questions will be whether it, the use of social media is work related, whether they can be identified uh, as, as part of the employment. Um, and employers shouldn't take a disproportionate view of the damage or potential damage to their reputation. As we said right at the beginning, uh, the tribunal will want to look at that. Um, and, and how, how much damage it could actually be proved. Um, looking then at interpersonal relationships, which I think goes to the heart of a lot of this, um, because it includes any relationships really uh, between people, um, but I think potentially we're, we're talking about relationships which go beyond the normal professional confines uh, found in a workplace. So family relationships, friendships, and of course, romantic relationships. Um, and it's something that you know interpersonal relationship training is is, a, is tends to be a good thing, um, but it can negatively affect the business when people are not getting on outside of work, um, especially if there's a if there's a fear of uh, conflicts of interest or confidentiality breaches as well, uh, or if the if the kind of the, the conduct of these individuals and the fact they can't get on together affects the productivity and the day to day running of the business, um, and. Essentially, fair dismissals could take place if the actions associated to the relationships, uh, like a breach of confidentiality or a reduction in productivity, occur. You need to look at that uh, in, in some detail, I think, um, in order to dismiss fairly on a conduct basis and make sure that uh, you, your investigation fully covers um, what the effects of this, this breakdown in a relationship between two uh, employees might be. Um, Similarly, you may find you know, that um, where people are having personal relationships outside of work, even if it's not with a work colleague, um, it can affect things like their, their productivity or their mood. Um, and so again, that may be something that comes up um, and uh, you know, that's something to consider. Where um, staff are on the same team or you know, work together closely, uh, that can introduce additional challenges. Uh, we put on the slide here discrimination, a point to note. I think one thing in particular there is uh, where you have, you know, um, for example, a romantic relationship. Um, if, especially if, it, if it's between different sex couples, then, you know, if one, cup, one person is treated differently from the other, say the woman is asked to leave and the man is not, or um, so on, then you, you're running a risk there of a potential discrimination aspect to it. Um, any um, action taken by the company against um, individuals who are party to an interpersonal relationship would need to be lawful and fair in its application. So you need to make sure you consider things like age discrimination, which may be another factor. You know, the, the younger, the younger uh, employee who's only been there a few a few years compared to the older employee who's been there a lot longer may want to keep the older employee. You need to consider whether that's potentially age discrimination against the younger. Um, those are those are things to consider. We've we've had quite a few. Um, it's sort of maybe not directly relevant to most of your work, but but you know we have a lot of family relationships in small businesses, um, and uh, that that can unfortunately um, go wrong. No one goes into a business, uh, especially starting your own business, whether that's with family or or you know, um, partners, you don't go into it expecting it to fall apart, but it can do. Um, in that respect, shareholders as well will want to protect themselves with properly drafted shareholders agreements. Um, and those are things which obviously we, you know, we and our colleagues advise on. Um, so those are some of the effects that, uh, um, you know, the unfortunate collapse of interpersonal relationships can have. Um, as Michael's already touched upon and you know with social media being such a hot topic 
um, and we presented on it in our HR Lunch Club in July this year. So I'll try not to dwell on it for too long. And also you can go back if you would like to and watch that HR Lunch Club, because I believe it's all on our YouTube yes. channel. So we're being recorded <laughs> now and we'll probably end up on there as well. Um, so should you miss that, you know, feel free to go back and watch it. Um, the use of social media is now commonplace. It's used by employees um, can obviously have very positive effects, including when it's used for marketing or recruitment, for example. Um, however, it can also lead to various issues, including potential, potential reputational damage um, to the company, which, again, I'll come on to later in the presentation. Um, all these topics kind of intertwine a little bit as we go along. Um, the decisions in tribunal cases involving employees' misconduct and the use of social media outside work suggest that in deciding whether a dismissal of an employee due to their social media usage was fair, the um, following will be points to consider. <clears throat> so the question of whether the employee's use of social media is work-related will depend entirely on the facts of the case. Um, employers shouldn't take a dis disproportionate view of the damage or potential damage to their reputation uh, merely because material that doesn't put them in the best light comes into the public arena. Um, the information given to employees about corporate image and reputation, as well as an employer's expectations as regard to the use of social media are also relevant. Uh, and these factors will be considered in conjunction with the other circumstances of the case, perhaps um, previous good service uh, when deciding whether a dismissal is fair or not. So again, it is entirely down to the employee, the situation, what has happened as with all of these cases. Um, I just wanted to mention the case here of Walters and Asda Stores. Um, in this case, the tribunal found that comments made by an ASDA manager on her Facebook site um, that it would make her happy to hit customers on the back of the head with a pickaxe uh, constituted misconduct rather than gross misconduct, which is interesting, um, and that her dismissal was unfair, which was obviously a dismissal for gross misconduct. Um, it was significant that Miss Walter's conduct fell into the misconduct category within um, the examples that were given on the employer's internet policy uh, rather than into the examples of gross misconduct and the policy didn't draw a distinction between staff and managers when assessing the seriousness of the conduct so the seniority of the level of, of the employee themselves so there's just a, a kind of a couple of things to bear in mind in terms of when we're looking at our social media policies for example you know making sure these things are properly defined, where, where we've got examples of the different types of misconduct and gross misconduct, and actually the levels of staff as well. Um, it must be correctly and com uh, clearly communicated to an employee as uh, in order to be able to support a decision um, as to whether to dismiss. Um, and that can obviously be done via the policy itself and staff training as well. Just going to pause a second. It occurs to me. I don't think we said right at the beginning, but if anyone has any questions, um, do feel free to to drop them into the chat box um, or store them up for the end. But uh, if you feel brave enough, come on the microphone and ask. But um, you know, uh, we're we're talking into the ether a little bit, so we're more than happy to answer, try and answer questions as we go or at the end. Um, so we'll have a chance to do that. Um, and now substance misuse. <laughs> this is obviously um, alcohol and hopefully to a lesser extent illegal uh, drug taking is something that does fuel a lot of the behaviors that we're talking about and i mentioned you know fighting in car parks <clears throat> certainly we've all had the office christmas party uh, which could go a little off the rails um alcohol it's and drug misuse can is likely to cause conduct but also performance issues um and they obviously in turn may damage the business um, and also may damage the reputation if, you know, if it's recognised that the, these people are employees of, of the business. So uh, that can have a reputational impact as well. Um, I think where a manager considers that um, there's been a deterioration in work performance or changes in pattern of behaviour, and that might be due to alcohol or drug misuse, I think we're talking more over a longer period here, um, then investigations should, 
should probably be started. Um, because if it becomes apparent that the employee's work or behavior is affected due to an addiction or a dependency, then I think you're looking more at a capability issue rather than one of misconduct. That's perhaps one you want to be approaching um, with more kid gloves um, and uh, you know, uh, encourage them to seek treatment, um, use occupational health and obtain an occupational health report in order to find out how to uh, best support that employee's welfare if it's, a, if it's an actual, actual health issue. Um, it should be noted that the Equality Act specifically excludes uh, drug and alcohol addiction from being a, a men, an impairment for the purposes of uh, a discrimination claim, you know, disability. Um, however, um, the effects of uh, a dependency, such as depression, um, I think that's a common one, um, that, that stems from something like an alcohol, alcohol abuse, um, that can be a, a protected characteristic under the, under the Equality Act. Um, so that's something to, to factor in, in any considerations, whether you're looking at a capability process or a conduct one. And um, in terms of conduct, I think where it's, for example, drug recreational drug use, um, especially if it's happening on site, you know, in the workplace, but I appreciate we're talking outside the workplace here, um, then that's more of a disciplinary issue and, and you should, should follow the normal formal disciplinary process. Um, it's not necessarily a conclusive reason to dismiss an employee, however, so the usual factors should be considered. Clearly, having a, a, um, a well-drafted drug and alcohol policy uh, is important. In some industries, testing is very common, in others, not at all. Um, and so, you know, in having that, having preparing that policy, you want to make sure it's sort of appropriate for your, for your um, set of circumstances. The case we refer to is actually deals with testing to a certain extent, Ball and First Essex buses, uh, just a couple of years ago. Um, that was a dismissal for gross misconduct um, rather than a capability one. It was a long serving employee. Uh, he had an unblemished record apparently, <laughs> uh, uh, but he failed a routine drug test for cocaine. Um, and it, the dismissal was found to be unfair. Now he had produced a number of other tests that showed he, he hadn't been using cocaine. Um, uh, but which were rejected as evidence um, during the disciplinary hearing. Um, and apparently there were, there were some flaws in their process. Um, their policy uh, didn't prohibit um, an alternative test results to be put forward by employees. So the fact that they then ignored them uh, was an issue. So they were breaching their own policy, um, which did say they would carefully consider any evidence submitted by an employee. So again, if, they, if you've got a policy, you wanna make sure you're following it albeit a breach of a policy is not uh, prima facie going to uh, cause you problems. It can, it can cause you problems, you know, as a buildup of evidence of an unfair dismissal. Um, they didn't really take his unblemished uh, record into account. Clearly taking illegal drugs seems to be, you know, outside of what he was normally, you know, like. Um, and the, the policy actually in this case only specified that being on duty under the influence of illegal drugs was gross misconduct. So, Failing a random drug test isn't, isn't covered by that. Um, so the, the dismissal was found to be unfair. So obviously policy wording is really very important to ensure, ensure it covers exactly what the company wants to rely on uh, in the event of a substance misuse situation. So now we're going to move on uh, to behavior dam damaging a company's reputation. So as already touched upon, employers may consider that an employee's conduct is sufficiently serious to justify a dismissal on the basis that continuing to employ them would have a negative reputational impact. Employers, of course, are entitled to protect their commercial interests against threats posed by their employees' actions and to take the necessary steps to achieve that end. If dismissal is the step taken, then assuming there's been no misconduct, some other substantial reason as the reason for dismissal will generally be relied upon. There are three main motivations behind such dismissals, uh, one of which is that the employer is seeking to protect its reputation against a risk posed by an employee's activities. However, there are only a limited number of tribunal cases which consider reputational risk, uh, and those that we've seen suggest that the threshold to defend an unfair dismissal claim on this basis is very, very high. Um, evidence will need to be sought and provided to the employee as part of the disciplinary process, 
to exemplify the reputational damage that the company is seeking to rely upon. Um, and it, it just needs to be so clear cut. It, that is what makes it so very high. In the case of uh, Wadley and Ega Electrical Limited, for example, um, the employer relied on the employee's wife's conviction uh, for dishonesty as the reason for dismissing the employee. And the Employment Appeal Tribunal um, accepted that such a reason might amount to some other substantial reason as the reason for dismissal if the wife's conduct had genuinely led to the employer's customers losing confidence in the employee. However, the EAT said that the employer would be required to adduce evidence that its customers did actually feel that way. So the evidence the employer actually has to be able to provide in those sorts of situations is, is that's just how high a hurdle it is to jump. Um, and one of the factors also that might be taken into account perhaps in a social media related case where it might be a post that um, would have the effect of damaging companies reputation and is the audience to which the damage has or potentially could reach for example if an employee posts something say on their facebook page uh, but their page is set to private uh, they only have say 50 friends the risk to reputation for the employer is obviously a lot less than if the employee makes a public tweet, has a number of followers, and that tweet gets retweeted a number of times, so suddenly it can actually reach quite a staggering audience uh, with the number of viewers. I mean, in that case, it's probably a lot easier to show there has been reputational damage directly as a result of the employee's actions, but it, it's establishing that link between the two. Um, which brings us to um, criminal behaviour. Um, which again, I think is um, one where, you know, you, you, it's going to need quite a close analysis of whether that criminal uh, activity, whether it's a conviction or an investigation by the police, um, whether it's, it affects the, the, the business. So it has a certain link with that reputational damage as well. Um, criminal behaviour may give rise to a fair reason to dismiss an employee. Um, um, and that may be to do with illegality or it may be a conduct issue as well. Um, but, you know, if it's conduct, then you need to make sure you follow the full disciplinary process. ACAS guidance um, is helpful here. Uh, it says that a police investigation, a criminal charge or conviction related to off duty conduct is not necessarily a reason for disciplinary action in itself. If the matter has no bearing on the employee's suitability for the job, or their relationship with their colleagues, the employer or its customers. So essentially they're saying an employee shouldn't be dismissed or disciplined solely because they've been charged or convicted of a, of a criminal offence. And I think what it comes down to is, is again, the link with the kind of offence and the link with their employment. Um, dishonesty offences, theft, um, fraud, those kinds of things, people in professional settings, um, you know, where they have lawyers, for example, um, we have a duty to, to, um, to, to keep clean hands and, and, and uh, um, uphold the reputation of the legal industry. And so if we have a criminal conviction for theft, even if it's un completely unrelated to work, it can affect things like our employment. Um, and where ACAS do, uh, what ACAS recommend in, in terms of where something does warrant disciplinary proceedings, they say the employer should investigate the facts as far as possible, come to a view about them and consider whether the misconduct is sufficiently serious, exactly as you'd expect in any dis, um, disciplinary process. Um, where it requires prompt attention, the employer doesn't need to wait until the outcome of the criminal prosecution before taking fair and reasonable action. I believe that's an important one. I've had clients where they've actually been hesitating because they said, oh, well, we can't interfere with the police investigation. It's important to find out from the police whether if there is a, you know, an ongoing investigation, whether uh, how much, what you can do, um, you don't want to um, certainly tip off a criminal um, or, or um, affect the investigation, but usually you would be able to act and, and follow a normal disciplinary process. So you shouldn't be waiting around to wait for the conviction. Um, it's a separate issue, you know, your own conduct process. Um, and um, certainly the police, on the other hand, shouldn't be asked to investigate on behalf of the um, employer. And so even if you have the police report and a, you know, a conviction, that's not necessarily conclusive uh, proof of misconduct because there are different tests and different issues. 
So consider all the relevant factors is essentially ACAS's summary, which is what you'd expect. The case uh, we've referred to, I think, on here, yeah, we have Lafferty and Nuffield Health. Uh, I did check it's not the local one in Chester, it's in Glasgow. Um, so it's the Scottish uh, Employment Appeal Tribunal. Um, originally, the Employment Tribunal uh, found that uh, the dismissal of a hospital porter who was charged with assault to injury with intention to rape was within the range of reasonable responses. Obviously, it's uh, again, it's a safeguarding issue in a hospital. It's a, it's a violent crime um, and, and one that's, you know, obviously is, is um, one that the hospital understandably would be concerned about. And so the EAT agreed with the Employment Tribunal and it was found to be a fair dismissal. Um, finally, I just mentioned illegality as opposed to misconduct um, and some of the substantial reason for dismissing. There may be, uh, there are certain job roles where uh, certain things are required. An obvious example would be a taxi driver or some kind of driver. And the illegality is if, you, if you're disqualified from driving, it's criminal behavior will be, or it's, it's related to criminal behavior. Um, if you lose your license, you can't drive, you can't carry out your job anymore. And usually that would be within the contract of employment as an express provision, but certainly that's what you would rely on as being a, a fair dismissal. Um, similarly, I mean, we mentioned lawyers again, you know, if, if, uh, if I lose my uh, practice certificate, then I'm not able to practice anymore as a solicitor and I would expect to lose my job. Um, which won't happen. Um, <laughs> so as ever, it is dependent on the facts, um, but it, it may not be a case of simply dismissing an employee. It may be that it's reasonable to offer um, suitable alternative employment. Um, if, you, if your taxi driver can't drive the taxi anymore, maybe they can work on the dispatch and, and be on a radio. So those are some of the things to consider in terms of criminal behavior. And finally, our tips. Uh, so as you can see throughout the whole of this presentation so far, the lines regarding conduct dismissal are certainly not clear cut. Um, so we've put together some tips for you um, for when you're faced with a situation whereby an employee's misconduct could result in termination and some proactive steps that can be taken prior to such conduct taking place, which hopefully will give you a bit of food for thought following today's presentation that you might want to take back and have a think about and look into what you've got in place. Um, so if you are faced with a particular situation, you need to risk assess what has actually happened. So some of the questions to consider, you might ask yourself, uh, might include, would the conduct be considered uh, to being associated to an employee's work or not? Uh, is it actually related to the workplace at all? Um, what's the employee's length of service and have they had any previous warnings, perhaps even on a similar basis? Um, with, with other misconduct issues. Uh, and then based upon your thorough investigations, which hopefully by this point you, you've begun to or have carried out, would the reasonable employer find it reasonable to dismiss the employee taking into account all of the circumstances, including what they obviously bring as evidence in any potential disciplinary hearing? Um, ensure the policies and procedures that you have in place define whether this particular um, act of conduct falls into the category of potential misconduct or gross misconduct, um, and that these examples are consistent with the reasons as to why you would want to dismiss an employee. Um, have you had a similar situation before? Um, what did you do in that situation? Um, perhaps actually it might be the kind of thing where it might borderline and actually you might want to provide training rather than um, the dismissal. So consider that as an alternative. Um, and you know, then you can full well show you have given that employee the training on that basis. So if they then do something in the future, you, you have that clear path there if things aren't as clear cut as you'd like them to be upon making the decision. Um, are you relying on a contractual provision? So what Michael just touched upon about the, the driver as part of their role, or for example, us as lawyers, we have in our contracts uh, that we have to have a certain, we have to hold our practicing certificate, we have to have our qualifications. There'll be a number of different roles to which that will apply, where people have to maintain a certain qualification or um, hold a certificate in something. Um, and of course, take legal advice if you're unsure um, whether the conduct is work related and if the sanction uh, being potentially imposed is going to be 
potentially fair. Um, we do keep coming back to that point, uh, sound very repetitive by mm. now, but there really isn't a one size fits all answer to this. And then in terms of proactive steps that we can suggest that you might want to take, um, obviously there might be some that are very specific to your workplace or industry as well as these. So we've kept these fairly generic to kind of suit as many people as possible. But of course, policies and procedures, we keep coming back to this and whether it actually, when you're looking at the situation, it, does it fall into the wording within your policies and procedures? Um, so these obviously need to clearly set out um, expectations and obligations in relation to employees. So I'm not just talking about um, what would constitute misconduct or gross misconduct in a disciplinary policy, which of course we've touched upon a few times, and that's clearly important, but what actually are more of a risk to your business? What can you put in your company handbook within your policies and procedures that actually affect your business um, specifically? Policies such as equality and diversity, grievance, discrimination, harassment, confidentiality, uh, data protection, social media. Obviously, we keep coming back to social media being one that kind of floats between all of the, the topics. And substance abuse policy, thinking about what Michael was saying earlier. Um, and then in addition to having those carefully drafted policies and procedures, actually providing regular training to employees and to managers on um, the awareness, what they might do in a certain situation, things to pick up on, things to um, perhaps a, a bit outside the box of where they might not realise something might have an effect or they might act too quickly and they actually need to take a step back and think about things. Um, specifically in relation to uh, social media, um, you should encourage staff to keep the contents of their profiles private as much as possible um, and make them aware that content can always be shared, um, which to, to most of us might be obvious, but in fact, having that conversation and telling employees that if you can show that you've taken that step, it, it's another bit towards that high hurdle you've got to, to, to reach in order to be able to show that you've taken all these steps. Um, we would also suggest informing that historic posts can still be observed and shared. You know, you wouldn't expect anybody to go trawling back seven years on somebody's profile, but, you know, especially someone who might come into the public eye a bit more and actually then that might happen. It, you know, you don't ever expect things to come back to haunt you, but unfortunately these things do happen. Um, and in fact, this might be something to add into perhaps your induction and onboarding training um, to discuss with new employees. Um, so perhaps encourage your new staff um, to make the right choices in regards to their social media accounts, maybe go through, get rid of any uh, potential skeletons, privatise things um, and just generally encourage them to make good choices. Um, you were talking about it a bit earlier about the possibility, what, what was it that you called it? To do with the- uh, I can't remember now. Where, where you can almost give them the opportunity to go away and then almost... Uh, like an, am an amnesty, essentially, I think, was what we were, what we were talking about. As, as part of the social media uh, session that we did on this a, a couple of months ago, we sort of suggested that one possible that possibility would be to have an amnesty um, where you essentially can, can talk to your employees as a group and say, Look, well, let, even offer some training on it, but you know, let, let's look at your, let's go back and vet your, your social media profile. Um, we were talking in that one particularly about, and I've now completely forgotten his name, there was a very young footballer who had, when he was about 14, tweeted some um, very inappropriate things and really, really regretted it by the time he was 19 and, and playing for um, whichever team it was. And I, I completely forgot his blank season is. But um, yeah, um, um, and certainly, Paul Hennessy who, and, and myself, who gave that session, were saying, you know, we felt that it, it, it was unfortunate that he hadn't been supported and taken in hand by the club as a young person to go, let's go back and look over your uh, social media history, especially someone so public facing. Um, and, and that's really seriously detrimentally affected his career as a result. Um, so uh, maybe not to that extent necessarily of actually vetting employees um, and, and going back and saying you need to delete this and that and the other, but having an amnesty where you say, look, for a while, we're, we're suggesting you go back and have a look over things and we're not going to look at stuff. Um, but, you know, hopefully 
that gives people an opportunity to think about what they've tweeted in the past, certainly when we're talking about historic, but I'm saying tweeted or posted, you know, whatever, Instagram, or whatever. Um, so that's what we were sort of thinking about. Yeah. Um, and then the last point I've, I've sort of noted here, um, to think about your contracts of employment. Um, so pro prohibiting employees from engaging in certain conduct, referring to the potential sanction of dismissal if such conduct is engaged in, Although generally we would suggest putting these things into your non-contractual policies and procedures and then referring to them within your, your contract itself. Um, and the reason we always suggest that is that if, it's, if the information is in your non-contractual policies, actually if you want to amend it or you know, make any changes to it, to uh, whether it's to do with legal changes or company changes or you, know, you just want to review it and make some updates, um, it's much easier to do that because, of course, you don't need to um, consult with your employees about the changes to a, a, a non-contractual policy. Um, so that's all the things I have got noted down. We have had one question in now. Um, it, it refers to a particular um, set of circumstances recently in the, in the, in the news. Um, it's something we can't specifically comment on, but to answer the kind of core of the question, which is where if someone posts something, again, it goes back to this social media point, and I think it is something we've covered a bit. If someone posts something hugely inappropriate uh, on, a, on a public forum, Twitter, Facebook, or whatever, and they're not, it doesn't specifically identify their employer, but that other people then go and uh, do doxing, is, is what it's called, when, when people go and find out everything they can about this individual, including their, their employer, and they start petitioning the employer and saying, you can't continue to employ this person, which is broadly, I think, what happened in this specific case. Um, you know, the, the, I suppose, that what's the, just, let me just check what the actual core of this question is. Um, yeah, does the employer have to show that the employee would have known that their conduct could be tied back to the employer? Um, the answer to that is no, not in so many words. I mean, it, again, it's unfortunately one of those case by case basis gray areas. Um, the case law shows that, yes, you know, if you're tweeting on a public forum, even if you're not identifying your employer, it should be recognized that there are usually ways of finding out. If you're tweeting on one platform, it's easy enough to search that name on LinkedIn and find that employee, for example, if they have a LinkedIn profile. Um, so it, there is some recognition that in this day and age, this doxing is, is possible and therefore any sort of really super inappropriate um, things that are tweeted can come back to the employer but then we still would highly recommend going back through those um, sort of checks and balances we've mm -hmm. talked about and, and doing your thorough investigation um, ensuring you've got evidence that it's affected for example the company reputation um, or it's affected I mean it won't have affected productivity necessarily but you know it's more of I think this is more of a reputational stroke social media issue and that those are the things that you're going to need to, to consider um, but as I say we obviously can't com comment on that specific um, set of circumstances but that's broadly the the um, situation that's, that's generally been um, decided by the tribunals um, that's the only question we've had though do you have any does anyone else have any Further questions here? <clears throat> Maybe just give it a minute, see if anyone wants to type anything in quickly. Um, or feel free to. Uh, or or if anyone wants to un if unmute. Like, if, you, if you feel brave enough. If you're able to, you might need to request uh, an unmute, but we can always do that. Um, and if not, then hopefully, I think ev hopefully everything we've given is, is, is useful and informative. This is the kind of thing that hopefully once we can get back to doing this face to face, we can have more of a round table discussion, I think, um, because it's a gray area um, or it's, you know, it's, a, it's one that, that, that involves a lot of non legal tests, if you like, or tests of reasonableness and things like that, that, that hopefully once we could we can discuss face to face and see if uh, see what people's opinions are, um, if, unless anyone wants to give any now. No, I didn't think so. All right, never mind. Well, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining. Um, it's just our legal disclaimer. Yes, um, sorry, Michael, there oh, is one question that's yes. just come in. Sorry, I can't quite read it. But... Is that on the chat? Um, where would the employees, the, where would the employer stand on em employees? Sorry, I just need to grow it. <laughs> Uh, 
where would the employer stand on employees that like another social media account or post which may display or share something inappropriate? That's getting down. Uh, yeah, into thank you. Yeah, I, I, it, it's it's similar. I mean, I think it's similar to all of these cases. Um, I think you'd I think you'd need to be very circumspect about dismissing outright on something like that. Um, um, that it's unlikely to be gross misconduct, really. Um, but that may depend on the circumstances. And people click on like, you know, often without thinking or without fully understanding the context of what they've liked um, or retweeted. Um, and so it's one where you need to, to really be. Yeah, I'm that, trying to, I think, I think that that's probably... that they've liked, but did they like it because they liked a particular post and then they happen to have come up with other things that they might not have seen or agreed with. It's just that they liked that particular yeah. account that has then posted these things. So they may not even be aware of it. Yeah. Um, and then how, how publicly available is the knowledge that they have liked this account? You know, if their profile and account is, is private, yeah. then I'm not sure it would be visible to the public yeah, that I'm, they have actually liked that account. So, I don't think on Twitter, even liking a specific post, I don't think you can see who's liked it necessarily um although if they retweeted that would maybe be a different situation but again i think often people retweet without necessarily thinking or fully understanding the context um and sometimes the things that people write uh, could be taken in two different ways so i think it, it's as ever it's a bit of a balancing exercise um i think you'd probably be hard pressed to find that was gross misconduct um, in any circumstances um but certainly is one that if you if it was sufficiently bad what they were you know retweeting or whatever then it's something you can investigate i think it depends if they're retweeting something that's overtly racist or fascist or whatever then yeah. then or, or violent um then there might be more grounds for it if they've just liked something i think that's a bit harder to prove um yeah. it would Share be hard to one of those yeah. posts and putting a comment on the top that expresses their own views that's where yeah. it changes the the boundary yeah, I would, exactly. I would say. And I think even then, you've still got to then factor in how does it affect the business? Why, you know, why is it relevant? It's not going to affect their productivity. So that, that's not the issue. It's not affecting them. It's a, it's about affecting the reputation of the business. And I think you find it again, unless you can show some kind of link, unless people have started petitioning you to sack them um, the, or, or they've got a very overtly work profile, then you'd have trouble. Um, I'm just thinking of a case. There was a case of a guy called Laws. Uh, Mr. Laws, um, who worked for game stores, the video game shops, and he, he, I always find it an interesting one. I don't think it's a well-known case particularly, but I find it sort of ironic because he was, uh, part of what he was doing was he set up a Twitter account in order to, uh, as part of his job, in order to vet employees' Twitter accounts and make sure that they weren't putting anything inappropriate on there. And then he put a load of inappropriate things on there and they dismissed him. And some of those were were retweets rather than his own his own comments. Um, and so, you know, I think, again, it was a factor in it. But I think there were some that were sort of just generally griping about work, which is the other thing, of course, that people put on social media. You know, they complain about the, about work or colleagues rather than things that are more general, like a racist thing. Um, yeah, I think liking I, I don't know how you'd even show show that someone had liked it. A, a post you know otherwise um but yeah hopefully that i think that covers all of that um great unless there's any more questions helen uh, i think we'll say thank you very much thank you very much um if you if anyone does have any specific questions obviously please feel free to get in touch and if if any of these issues do come up then obviously i would say seek legal advice on a lot of this because if anything we've shown it's a bit of a gray area thanks very much thanks